Good evening, everyone. My name is Patrick Donahue, and I'm a member of the Lakeside Gem and Mineral Club, re-recording this presentation on the meteorites of Washington State, because I thought it was a kind of fun uh, presentation that I wanted to share with a broader audience. Now, the background of this slide is a satellite composite image of Washington State, and we'll come back to that in a minute. But first, I thought it would be important to talk a little bit about meteorites before going into the of Washington State part of this talk. Now, meteorites record a variety of formation environments and solar system processes. Uh, some of the first condensates of the solar system were chondrules on the left-hand side there. And these primitive materials started accreting into rubble piles, loosely conglomerating, and back in February, when I first gave this presentation, the club sent out an article on the asteroid Bennu being sampled by the OSIRIS-REx mission. Now that's a B-type asteroid that would probably be found in one of these more primitive asteroid types on the left, uh, which is why it's so important to study to understand the evolution of the solar system. Now those that gain enough mass experience some internal heating, which could lead to low temperature, thermal and or aqueous alteration, and larger masses then produced melt and differentiation for the largest, like on Earth. Now, the latter stages are important for investigating how planets form and evolve, which is a lot of how my research went and how, why I'm interested in meteorites. Uh, but back to the map of Washington. Um, there's a few extra a few cities on here just to orient you and conveniently most meteorites are named after where they were found uh, so the meteorites of washington state are shown here in white text there's tacoma on the left i can't use that okay we have there's tacoma on the left uh, above that is Kirkland to the right, and central Washington is the Waterville and Withrow meteorites. And in eastern Washington, there's Albion and then Colton, just north of Pullman. And down here in Vancouver on the bottom left, there's Washougal. Uh, Washougal is a city on the outskirts in the Vac Vancouver area, and that'll be the first meteorite I talk about. As you can see, it has a slightly different uh, symbol next to it, and that's because it's a little different type of meteorite than the other ones. Uh, I'm starting with Washougal for two reasons, and one is that it was Washington State's first officially recognized meteorite. I have first meteorite on here with an asterisk because the Waterville and Tacoma iron meteorites were actually found earlier. However, although the Waterville was locally recognized as a meteorite earlier, it was not formally described until 1940, whereas Washougal was recorded in 1939. And until a meteorite is formally described, it doesn't exist in the, the literature. Now, there may be even earlier recognized meteorites in local tribes, but I'm not familiar with their stories enough to know. Uh, but if anybody else knows, I'd be very interested to hear of any meteorite stories. Now, at the time, Washington was the only state to not have a meteorite recorded in its borders. And the reason it was actually so quickly recognized as a meteorite was because it was recovered after a fireball in early July that was seen above Portland. Now, locals went in search and recovered a few unusual looking fragments. And it's actually important that they found them so quickly because the longer meteorites lay on the ground, especially in a place like rainy Portland, the less likely you'll be to recover samples and the less likely they'll be to be pristine and so you lose some of that scientific value. Now that goes double for the type of meteorite that Washougal turned out to be. It's a Howardite, which is a regolith breccia made up of eucrite and diogenite components. Eucrites and diogenites are two other types of meteorites and then those get crushed and then mixed together to form Howardites essentially. And what's really cool about Howardites and the HED group is that we have a really good candidate for the source of those meteorites, and that source is asteroid 4 Vesta, generally just called Vesta. It is the second most massive body in the asteroid belt and has been just blasted to heck by meteorites over the years. 
Uh, based on radar and other techniques, uh, scientists have concluded that its surface composition matches well with the HED meteorites. So here on the bottom left is a diagram of magnesium versus aluminum, showing the field of diogenites, the field of eucrites, and then the mixture of the two that make it howardites. Uh, and eucrites are a stony meteorite which contain no chondrules, so none of that the primitive material has been reconfigured. And it's a highly basic gabbro consisting mainly of anorthite and augite. Uh, for the club, you can think of it kind of like the Columbia River basalts if they never erupted and instead cooled underground. So it could coarsely crystalline intrusive volcanic rock. That's very uh, mafic. Diogenites, on the other hand, are coarse grained plutonic rocks with primarily magnesium rich orthopyroxene with small amounts of plagioclase and olivine. This would be something more like the source magma for some of the Cascade volcanoes, uh, perhaps, that cooled far underground for a long time. And so that evidence points to this very large body having interior geologic processes, at least sometime in the past, like in the diagram I showed earlier. Now, there are probably different, different compositional layers inside the crust, and then impacts excavate these at varying depths. And like I said, Vesta has been beaten up pretty good over the millennia. It's probably at least as old as Earth, and we see evidence for multiple giant impacts on its surface that would have excavated material and flung it across the solar system, some of which landed on Earth, which is why we have the meteorites that we have today. Two examples are the, of impact basins are the Venenea Basin and the Rhea Silvia Basin, which are overlap and are several hundred kilometers in diameter. Now for comparison, Chicxulub is about 150 kilometers or so. And Rhea Silvia is actually the tallest mountain in the solar system at 14 miles high. Uh, and you know, these are staggering scales and it's possible on a, body like, on a body like Vesta because there aren't the same geologic processes weathering the peaks down like there are on Earth or Mars. And for just a little more context, this is a composite from the Planetary Society of all of the non-planets to scale. Vesta is on the lower right-hand side, just above the P in the Planetary Society logo. Now you can maybe tell that it's a little bit oblong in this direction, and that's because it's been so smashed up that it's no longer as round as it once was. And the Rhea Silvia Basin from the previous slide is actually about the same size as Mare Crisium on the moon, which if you look at the moon image, it's just above the T in the, kind of on the right-hand side on the right limb there. Uh, so briefly back to Washougal, the described pieces have some typical meteorite, meteorite characteristics like the fusion crust. On the top left image there, the black is the fusion crust, and that's caused by atmospheric heating as the meteorite entered Earth's atmosphere that melts and quenches into this black, uh, almost glassy material. And the, materi the interior is a mixture of the light-colored diogenite components with dark-colored eucritic components. And there are some big minerals like olivine uh, here in the, on the right-hand side. Uh, there's also anorthite, augite, and plagioclase. These are, uh, these two images are microimages. I'm not sure if that's a quarter or a dime. It's two on the right and left hand side, but there's, it's pretty small. And the sample itself is only a few centimeters across. Now, Washougal is the only confirmed fall in the state, which means that someone observed it falling. The other, the other meteorites in Washington are iron meteorites, and these are all finds. So someone found them, essentially dug them up or noticed them lying on the ground, but we don't know when exactly they fell. Uh, so I'll get to those in a minute, uh, but there is another oddball in this group, and that's the Kirkland meteorite on the left-hand side with the little X next to it over in Seattle. And the meteorites reported from Kirkland were recovered by a local hobbyist astronomer in 1955. Uh, so here he is in this very dramatic photo from a local newspaper showing two puncture holes in, of the meteorite in his backyard observatory. Now he submitted these meteorite fragments to, for identification and indeed they were meteorites. 
However, there was immediate suspicion that he wasn't exactly on the up and up. And indeed, the trouble with extraordinary claims is that they require extraordinary evidence. And besides the unusual circumstances of a guy who is very interested in this kind of thing having a door delivery, uh, there wasn't any fireball, the samples were degraded far beyond what they should have been for a fresh fall, and later isotopic analyses of the and geochemistry as well showed them to be identical to those from the Canyon Diablo crater uh, meteorites. And those have been sitting around for almost 50,000 years, so they're, they match pretty well with what we see in terms of weathering. And so my advice to you is to not try and pull one over on the meteoritical community uh, because they have quite an arsenal of investigative techniques to suss out the truth of the matter. Uh, but enough about pseudo-meteorites, back to the real stuff and iron meteorites that have been found across Washington state. And now iron meteorites require parent bodies to reach large enough sizes to differentiate and create large reservoirs of iron and nickel metal, typically in their cores and mantles. And what happens is they then cool and become dead planets, more or less, and these get smashed up, exposing their inner layers, possibly remelting or mixing different components, like with the HEDs, and then those get spread across the solar system and some land on Earth. Iron meteorites come from M-type asteroids, and it should maybe be no surprise that M stands for metallic. These make up less than 10% of known asteroid types, why might that be? Well, in part, it's because of the series of steps that you need to undertake in order to get there, uh, going all the way up from these little chondrules all the way up to a molten core, and then destroying it, but not so much that the pieces are too small to see or don't survive. And fortunately, these M-type asteroids are easy to see in radar because of the metal, which is very highly reflective in radar. And what I think is cool is that NASA is actually working on visiting one of these. Uh, if you think of the Earth, we've never seen the core and we'll probably never get there. But with these iron meteorites, we have a chance to see firsthand what the once molten interior of planet, a planet looked like. Now this is an artist concept of Psyche, which shows some of the potential features that may be waiting for the, the future mission including huge iron cliffs and frozen splashes from previous impacts into the metal. And now there's a lot of M-type asteroids and meteorites out there, and compositional differences point to many different unique planetary cores as well. So lots of different bodies actually grew large enough to form these cores, and then they were smashed up. And we get a lot of different representation of those on Earth. And those are picked apart by differences in geochemistry, like iridium and gallium on the left, and these point to dozens of different planetary bodies, or parent bodies, for these cores. And what it means is that iron meteorites come from multiple different parent asteroids that were destroyed and flung to Earth. They're named very simply as a combination of Roman numerals and letters. Now, it does get confusing because they overlap quite a bit in many compositional fields, and then it can be kind of mind-numbing to, to discern is 1A, 1B, 2A, 1AB, 3B, 3D. It kind of blends together after a while, in my head anyway. And, but that means that if you find an iron meteorite, because there's so many different possible parent bodies, you may be holding the only piece on Earth of what was once the molten iron core of a planetesimal. So there are five real iron meteorites that have been found in Washington. They're all finds rather than falls, as I mentioned. And so they're all lying on the ground for X number of years before they were recovered. And a quick reminder that the Waterville and Tacoma were found before the Howardite Washougal, so 1917 and 1925, uh, although they weren't described until later. Uh, Waterville was the earliest and remains Washington's largest find at 37 kilograms or about 82 pounds. And I thought it might be interesting to note as a side note, it's actually very easy to find any meteorite you want. So if you're in a different state, you can look up the meteorites that come from your state by going to the Meteoritical Society uh, bulletin, Meteoritical Bulletin Database, 
where you can search by every conceivable combination of properties, like where it was found, when, what country, uh, by name, if you happen to know. And this is the start of the entry for Waterville, which lists a good overview of what's known about the meteorite. So you can see on the bottom left, the on the bottom, the classification history, it was originally called a 3CDAN or anomalous, and then it was later revised to a 1AB uh, ungrouped iron meteorite in 2006. And further down on this page could be a description and of the meteorite as it was first recovered and photos if there are any. Oftentimes there's a story associated with some of these older ones that were found in specific locations like the Waterville. So like if a, if a farmer found it, they might, that might be noted. And the Waterville is a type 1AB ungrouped iron, which means that it falls in the 1AB field and but hasn't been paired with other meteorites. It, has found, it was found in 1917 in a farmer's field, and some sources suggest that the meteorite must have fallen between 1916 and 1917 because it was found on plowed land in 1917 that was plowed in both 1916 and 1917, but it wasn't found the previous year. Uh, for many years, it was actually a local attraction at a store where people could pay to take a whack with a hammer and try to break pieces off. Uh, there's no evidence that anyone did, but it was later lent to the Washington State History Museum. Uh, they borrowed it, but weren't exactly good caretakers and they cut off pieces for poor reasons. I'm not, sh I'm not sure that it's known where those pieces went to. There was actually a legal battle by a couple of locals from central Washington in order to get it out of the State History Museum's hands, and they won, and it now rests at the Douglas County Historical Museum, which is in Waterville, I believe. Uh, it wasn't described until 1940, which is the year after Washougal, although it was discovered much earlier. And the small piece on the right-hand side shows rusting, which is a common problem with iron meteorites. The Withrow meteorite, which is a 3AB iron meteorite, likely, was found in 1950 in Withrow, which is just down the road from Waterville. It was the second meteorite found in this relatively small area, so Waterville calls itself the unofficial meteorite capital of Washington State. It is also the at the Douglas County Historical Museum, and I think this photo from their Facebook page shows the Withrow above the Waterville. There, and as a side note, there actually was another, supposedly, another 11 pound meteorite that was found near Withrow before 1951, but it's unaccounted for, it was never described, and so does it really, did it ever really exist? You know, that's one of the things, if it's not in the literature, who can say if it was actually just a old wives tale? Now, there is little information on the Tacoma 1AB meteorite, which was found over near Seattle. It was found between 1925 and 1932 by a farmer, William McDowell, and wasn't described until 1977. It's probably one of those cases where someone found an interesting rock and kept it for a long time until they or someone realized, hey, maybe that's a meteorite. Let's take it down to the university and see. And another factor was that Tacoma was, at the time, the smallest iron meteorite ever found slash recorded. Uh, it comes in at less than an ounce in weight, and the bits of it are kept at the Smithsonian and UCLA. So moving over to eastern Washington in Albion, the Albion meteorite is a type 4, or, yeah, 4A iron, and so nearly identical to another meteorite Gibeon that one of the big names in UCL meteorite classification, uh, John Lawson, suggested that it may have been mislabeled, to put it nicely. Uh, he said that someone needed to verify that it had been found where it was claimed to be from. Now I assume that it was verified or later analyses proved it was in a unique uh, proved it was a unique find or in a unique geochemical field because it still exists as its own separate meteorite. 
uh, Albion was the first one where we have some good photos of the Widmannstaaten pattern, the crisscross metal grains of camasite and taenite that form from slow cooling. Uh, Albion has a few vugs as well, or bubbles, where iron uh, precipitated into druzy spheroids. It's a relatively large sample, and I think there are a few pieces out there for sale every now and then. On the top left, this was from the Tucson Mineral Show. I'm not sure if that piece was for sale or just on display. Uh, but when I gave this presentation the first time, someone asked why you would get bubbles in a, an iron core, given how high the pressures were. And I think the answer there is that this would have formed after the planetary body was destroyed and broken up and it released enough pressure in order to exolve some gas and then refroze and precipitated some iron out. And finally, Colton, which is relatively nearby to Albion, had its own meteorite found in 1993, so relatively recently. It's a whopping 43 pounds and so relatively large. However, I wasn't able to find any photos of it. There are supposedly samples at the Smithsonian, but I contacted them before the pandemic started and requesting a photo, but I haven't heard back. If you go there, maybe you can find it if it's on display. So instead, here are a couple of other 3AB iron meteorites uh, with some fusion crust, Vidmanstadt pattern, uh, but really physically the iron meteorites generally have similar appearances. I mean, they're mostly made of the same stuff, differ, differing just in the relative proportions, maybe the thickness of the, the camasite, taenite, uh, Vidmanstadt patterns. So that's what's fallen and has been found in Washington state so far. There are, of course, periodic contributions from outer space. Things are falling on the Earth all the time. And these days, there are systems of sky watchers in place to track fireballs. The American Meteor Society, not the Meteoritical Society, the Meteor Society, hosts user-submitted records of observed fireballs. And an expedition actually used those observations to find the likely resting place of a recent fall in 2018 and they recovered fragments off the coast of the Olympic National Forest. So whether you might count that as uh, meteorites from Washington State, you can be the judge of that. Uh, there are also lots of professional meteorite hunters that will swarm in on any observed fireball where there's a chance a piece landed somewhere they can get to. Uh, so honestly, your best bet to finding your own Washington State meteorite is to just buy a farm and plow the land and keep an eye out for anything unusually heavy because iron meteorites are the most likely to survive just because they're so dense and a little more resistant to weathering, especially on the east coast, on the east side of the state, where it's dry enough that they might survive for a bit longer than on west of the Cascades. And if you want to find a meteorite, really your best bet is to go to a rock show or just search online and find a, a pretty sample. So the, in the... January edition of our local newsletter, there was a list of oddball mineral names uh, like Leverite and Meteorongs. And Meteorongs are actually what you find 99% of the time when you think you found a meteorite. Around here in, in central Washington, the two most common uh, Meteorongs would probably be vesicular basalt and slag. And finally, where are the Washington meteorites now? Well, there may be some in private collections, but if you want to have a chance of seeing any, you'd have to go to a few select locations. And we actually have a little drama where Washougal was supposed to be at the Oregon Museum of Natural History, but it's actually currently unaccounted for. The good photos I showed earlier were from a private collector who might have some of the only pieces left. And these are one of the few samples of Washougal are, you know, these sand sized pieces. They're so small that it's actually kind of tough to tell what they are with the naked eye. Uh, but in the center of the image there, those darker splotches are a little, little bits of fusion crust, I believe. And the 
for Waterville and the Withrow. The Douglas County Historical Museum is less than three hours from the Tri-Cities, if anyone is itching to go see some big chunks of planets. They are, as far as I know, the only in-state repository of Washington meteorites. I don't know if there's any at WSU or the University of Washington. Uh, otherwise, you'd have to go to Los Angeles for the Tacoma, Arizona State for Albion, or the Smithsonian for a smattering of the other ones. Uh, but definitely keep an eye out for those names at any gem and mineral shows that you attend in the future, as you never know when a piece might come up for sale, from the bigger pieces at least. And so that brings me to the end of the presentation. So thanks for listening.